Islamic finance is the term used to describe a system of finance led by principles concerning Sharia law. Its roots can be traced back almost 1400 years and is widely used by countries with large Muslim populations. In this programme, we'll be looking at Malaysia, one of Islamic finance's greatest success stories, and how it answered a lucrative call from one of the most influential economies in the Western Hemisphere. Malaysia is currently the global leader of Islamic finance and the country's economy has been booming. In 1980, Malaysia's GDP was near $25 billion. By 2014, that figure stood at just over $338 billion, a substantial increase. Situated on the southern end of a peninsula in the South China Sea, Malaysia is one of the fastest growing emerging economies in the world, having successfully capitalized on an emerging markets boom that happened shortly after the 2008 financial crisis. Now, it's looking to expand. The mood amongst many Islamic investors is that it's time for a change. They want to see Islamic finance as a serious alternative sitting alongside conventional finance. Investors, such as those from Malaysia, are looking to capitalize on this through innovation and cooperation to propel it forward. Investors now from the Middle East, from Southeast Asia, are looking towards a sort of a hybrid, a mixed model of financing. They don't only want to rely on conventional, they want to have a healthy Islamic and in some instances an entirely Islamic uh, you know, uh, financing package. It has led to um, the development of a dual banking system in Malaysia. So the Islamic banking system coexists with the conventional um, financing system. And because of that, there's, they've actually managed to create a level playing field for both the industries. And this has helped to help the customers actual, actually in assessing um, both types of financing. I think it's a question of choice. I believe that people should be given the choice. In fact, what you've got to bear in mind is that number of non-Muslims actually uh, subscribe to Islamic finance products. So Islamic finance uh, products are not confined merely to Muslims, but also to non-Muslims as well. I think Malaysia has such a head start on the rest of the Muslim world uh, or the rest of the markets that it's going to take a monumental effort from countries such as Saudi Arabia or UAE to catch up. Malaysia's economy has had its ups and downs, having expanded 5.6% at the beginning of 2015 only to slow to 4.5% in January 2016. But in today's challenging economic climate, this is welcome growth. Add to this an uptick in investment and private consumption, Malaysia has become a barometer for the emerging markets and Islamic finance. Well, uh, I think the government support is uh, critical and key to what we have accomplished in the last uh, 10 or 15 years in Islamic finance. Uh, the target which was given by the government by the year 2020, all government business dealings will be Islamic based. So with that in mind, a lot of the financial institutions have geared their strategy towards uh, Islamic finance as opposed to conventional. The main reason why Malaysia is leading is because they've got an extremely good support from the Malaysian government. The Malaysian government has come up with um, acts and regulations specifically for the Islamic finance industry. And it's, it goes back to the first act in 1983, and they've, they've um, gone ahead of all the countries in the world in doing that. And because Malaysia has got this head start, they've decided from the beginning, we're not just gonna have Islamic banking in terms of finance and banking, we're gonna have the complete architecture. So in Malaysia, you have a Islamic money market, interbank, uh, you know, uh, check clearing system. You've got the interbank system, the short-term liquidity management. You've got uh, the safety nets, deposit insurance scheme. So you've got that entire, even in Malaysia, you can, for instance, zakat 
you can pay zakat in lieu of income tax and you can pay it on, on, on online so it's a much more structured support from the Malaysian government goes beyond legislation and acts however the government has built an entire network around education that has proven itself to be an essential component for Islamic finance and investment abroad there's a lot of demystification required of, of Islamic finance. You know, there's a lot of negative connotations in the world, in the media today. And, and education is the first thing you need uh, to educate people about Islamic finance. So I believe there are four or five very established institutions. We have uh, very well-known Sharia scholars, people who are qualified to teach uh, the classes. So, so people like us, you know, who are working and also students, you know, you know they have a degree in Islamic finance, which is you know, incredible. Uh, ten years ago, such a uh, profession or degree doesn't exist, and now you can actually get a master's degree or PhD in Islamic finance. And in Malaysia also, the Sharia scholars have to be registered and regulated. And not only that, they've got to show that they have the right education from the right universities or the right institutions. Plus, they've got to have the right skill sets. London. It's always been an attractive hotspot for foreign investment. This couldn't be clearer to see than in the property market, when house prices surged 32% in 2014, thanks mostly to overseas buyers. And yes, Islamic finance has played an important role, seizing on a controversial statement by British Prime Minister David Cameron back in 2013. I want London to stand alongside Dubai and Kuala Lumpur as one of the great capitals of Islamic finance anywhere in the world. I think in recent years, Islamic finance has been a very important growing component of London's offering as a leading global financial centre. I think increasingly now, um, government is aware of the relevance of Islamic finance and perceives that it is important to have this capability to underline its credentials as a global centre. There has been a lot of focus on London real estate, um, but recently I've also seen a lot of focus on uh, real estate outside of London. So in second cities such as Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Bristol. So real estate is, is, um, is an easy investment because it's, it's real. You can see it, it's tangible. We have not seen uh, any significant development at this point in time. So I believe uh, Islamic finance in the UK is probably at a very infancy stage. It will take many, many more years for it to be developed. The point I think we need to make is that it, it doesn't involve interest, it doesn't involve riba, it's transparent, uh, there's accountability. And obviously, Islamic finance is also used in investment, which does good to the community. That's very, very important. So we are fulfilling a function, not only uh, providing the cover, but also helping the country in, in, in promoting, in, in, in enhancing its social work. Malaysian investment via Islamic finance, however, is already evident in London. Most notably, the £1.2 billion shard in London Bridge and the old Battersea power station, which was bought by Malaysian investors in 2012 for £400 million and turned into luxury flats. Sukuk bonds, otherwise known as Islamic bonds, have steadily increased, with 53 Sukuk listings on the London Stock Exchange since 2009. But with competition getting stronger and assets becoming more diverse, how do Malaysian investors keep on top of the legal aspects when investing in a complex city like London? Well, um, if, if a Malaysian investor comes to me and say they want to invest in, in, um, in the UK, first of all, I'd, I would tell them to do their due diligence and actually look at the, prop, uh, the investment that they want to do or the project that they want to do to make sure whether it is um, commercially viable, which is always the main thing. And secondly, to make sure that it is Sharia compliant. Malaysian investors feel quite familiar with the UK. There's so many connections between the two countries. The legal systems are very similar, uh, both common law based. And that means that many Malaysian lawyers are familiar with the English legal system. But things change and it's not safe to invest money in an environment where 
you don't know what all the legal implications might be. You could be taking risks. Uh, you could be entering into transactions that give you liabilities in the future that you need to understand. Every country has its own legal system and each present challenges for investors. For Islamic investors, however, there's an extra hurdle to overcome when considering investment projects in non-Islamic economies. Sharia compliance. Balancing between the law of the land and the Sharia, because you, want, you need both. We want both in, in, in these types of Sharia compliant transactions. So what, what would happen if it was in Malaysia? The, if there is a dispute, then the dispute would be governed by Malaysian law. All commercial um, aspects of the deal would be governed when I looked at from a Malaysian law perspective. But if the parties have an issue with respect to Sharia principles, then they would, they would probably most likely go to a different type of um, avenue. So it, they would probably go to arbitration or mediation. Your average person on the, on the street is, is thinking about this, you know, how does, how Sharia compliant is this? So I think th there is a need and there is an effort being made that we need to move more closer to the actual authenticity of the product. The biggest challenge has been balancing authenticity with innovation and getting the two right. And you, know, you don't want to trade off in the sense that you compromise on the authenticity. There have been occasions where uh, English law governed transactions have been challenged by uh, Islamic investors on the grounds that the transaction that was put in place was not Sharia compliant. That doesn't wash with the English courts because the English courts say we are not competent to determine Sharia compliance. That is for you the investor or you, the bank, to determine. Have you got the fatwa that, that says that this arrangement you put in place is Sharia compliant or not? That's for you personally to satisfy yourselves about. As far as we're concerned, as an English court, we'll look at the agreement and we'll look at it in accordance with what's written and what the law requires, the English law requires, and we'll enforce it in accordance with that, that written agreement. Islamic finance infrastructure in non-Islamic economies is still in its development stage and this is challenging for investors who want to reinvest in other Sharia compliant projects. It can be risky if those investors, due to a lack of opportunities, have no choice but to cash out. I was invited to do business in China, you know, but the problem is when I collect the premiums, I don't have any Islamic investments in, in China. So I have, to, I have to expose the company to currency risk. You know, whereas in Indonesia and Malaysia, there are Islamic banks, there are Islamic bonds, uh, there are Islamic uh, equity, which we can invest. But in countries where they don't have such instruments, including the UK, what do you do? So China is a huge area for Malaysia to grow into as well, and Chinese are really interested. Last month, I think the uh, Islamic Cooperation Development Bank, which is part of the IBD, uh, IDB, sorry, uh, did a big event in China. And Malaysia is the closest home for that. So I, I do feel that Malaysia's got a lot of room to uh, improve, has also got a lot to, to gain, and has relationships in each direction. I think it's a question of market education. A lot of the British companies are not fully aware of the structures and the benefits of Sukuk, uh, you know, raising funds through Sukuk. And I think the UK can carve itself out a, a really important niche, especially in financing the small and medium uh, enterprises. Give another five, ten years, as more and more corporates become familiar with Sukuk and, and structures, and the banks realize that you've got to educate your market before you can sell them a product. I think, you know, I'm a bit, uh, I'm not too pessimistic. I think there is a real chance that this may happen. <laughs> Despite the fact that Islamic finance is still in its infancy in the UK, the Malaysian and British governments clearly want this relationship to continue. But at the heart of it lies investment, particularly in the issuance of Sukuk. Certainly the inaugural sovereign Sukuk was extremely successful at different levels. Um, it enabled the UK to be the first Western sovereign to issue a Sukuk. Um, it was very important because it offered sterling denominated AAA rated paper and we do have 
a number of Sharia compliant um, banks here in the UK that actually need that sterling denominated paper or high quality liquid assets as, as they're referred to for regulatory reasons. But going ahead, you know, a lot of people have said, well, the UK government hasn't come back to the market yet. But one thing that I would raise is that last year um, there was an aviation sector, Sukuk, that had the support of UK export finance. Now that approached, well, it was, it was in excess of $900 million. If you look at the, where the main challenge is, that's in corporate Sukuk issuances, Hardly anything has happened. I can only think of two. One was a small $10 million one, which was privately placed. This is an IT company in the north of England uh, who placed it with a Dubai investor. And the second one was uh, a series of small, small sukuks related to real estate transaction uh, issued by Gatehouse Bank, which is one of the Sharia compliant. So the uh, potential is huge. If I'm not mistaken, there has been one or two issuance of suku in the UK. Uh, you know, I wouldn't consider that as, as being successful in the form of Islamic finance. There has to be a lot more. Uh, Malaysia, two years ago, was, was the number one issuing country for suku in the world. You know? and, and I think there's a lot more opportunities for suku uh, issuance in the UK. I think UK is a growing economy. There's always a need for infrastructure, construction and, and other funding requirements. Despite improving its portfolio abroad, fragile global markets continue to create strong headwinds for Malaysia's economy. But it has shown surprising resilience, boosted by a growth in exports such as electronics and palm oil. But maintaining investment opportunities through Islamic finance abroad against such headwinds won't be easy. When you say sukuk, it's always dependent upon the underlying contract. So you could choose a, a, a whole host of contracts. If you choose a, an ijara, which is a leasing contract, or a murabaha, which is a cost plus, both of them are debt-based and they're very prevalent. Now, if you're going to go down that route, clearly there is that problem that you've just highlighted. So yes, Malaysia could be open to that. I think for Malaysia, one of the, hurt, one of the hurdles that they would probably need to look at is to do more international deals. Um, I think, f from my view, a lot of the Sukuk deals, for example, are actually domestic deals. Um, I think there should be more... There is, at the moment, cross-border financing and a lot of international deals, but I think there should be a step towards having more of those and, in, and um, doing more deals with the rest of the world globally. And I think that would definitely place Malaysia in, in a different category altogether. We have a very substantial Muslim population and their engagement in uh, commerce and industry in the UK isn't as great as perhaps it has potential to be. So I think that there is a natural growth within the Muslim population of the UK to grow their commercial and financial integration with society generally, and that would naturally be using Islamic finance, Islamic products. For all Malaysia's achievements and contributions towards growing Islamic finance globally, its rise to the top hasn't come without its fair share of criticism. Now, this re relationship between Islamic issuance, capital market products, and conventional products is where you find a challenge. So in Sukuk, it's grown 56%. So 56% of the conventional, the wider capital markets is Islamic where the biggest challenge is banking and takaful because in their banking they've only got 21% of Islamic banking the rest is conventional banking and in takaful it's only 10% so they really need to up the game there Despite this criticism, Malaysia still leads the pack commanding over 80 billion pounds in total Islamic bank assets and over 60% of the global sukuk market This is considerably less for other Muslim countries so, what's next for Malaysia, now that it's shown Islamic finance can sit alongside conventional finance? And will its partnership with the UK last? It's a case of Malaysia learning from others and also Malaysia giving something back, including our country here in the UK. The opportunity for Malaysia is, is to keep you know, ahead of the curve um, and any work it, it does in partnership with uh, Indonesia. Now, that's a sleeping giant right close to Malaysia. Um, and a lot of people and a lot of investors have got the eye on, on, on Indonesia. So Malaysia working in tandem with countries, neighbouring countries like China, 
uh, Indonesia and, and being the leader of that pack. We believe the potential for growth and for us to introduce Islamic finance in more developed economies such as the UK, the US and Japan is probably more critical and important because we have to prove to the world that Islamic finance works in, in the developed environment where the infrastructure and the need for funding is there. We believe Kuala Lumpur's uh, position as the, as the regional centre for Islamic finance and it's got some pretty big neighbours in Singapore and Hong Kong who could try and wrestle that position from KL but KL has, Kuala Lumpur has managed to achieve that position. The one thing it lacks is the same level of professional and, and, and uh, financial support, infrastructure support that exists in those other places. Malaysia is so far ahead it's, it's simply because of that fact it will continue to lead until there is a dramatic change in terms of, you know, whichever new government comes into power. And I don't think that will happen. And, 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 and as I said, in Malaysia everything is based on rules and regulations and law. Yes, it's not the perfect market. There's still quite a few things to be done and there are some anomalies, you know, and this and that. But uh, I, I can't see any other country that, can, that even comes near to Malaysia in terms of its architecture, in terms of its government support, and in terms of the institutional support it gets. Malaysia is an innovator. It's expanded its economy through exports and investments abroad, using a mixed model of Islamic finance and conventional finance under one centralised code of operations. It's opened the eyes of the international community, whilst outshining its competitors. But its global advance could slow from a lack of Islamic finance infrastructure abroad, whilst competition from its neighbours will likely grow, becoming a serious challenge for the future.